Where will our food come from if we can't import it? And we have developed all the arable farmland. That is something that Mark Arellano wants us to consider. Mark's a documentary filmmaker who grew up in the greater Toronto area, and he has seen the changes here as subdivisions have replaced farmers' fields. And he's also seeing it in British Columbia's fruit-growing Okanagan Valley as well. His film, Strange Fruit, a changing landscape in the central Okanagan, is part of the Planet in Focus Film Festival, and that is happening all this weekend in Toronto. Mark Arellano is here this morning. Hello, nice to meet you, Mark. Very nice to meet you, Mary. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, here. thank you. I know, because you just, just got off the plane, <laughs> literally. That's right. Now, you grew up, uh, as I said, in northwest Toronto. Tell me, what, it, what was it like back then? Well, I don't want to idealize anything or romanticize it, but uh, it was farmland. It was cornfields, as far as you can see. If you think about where Square One is currently, that was that big was shopping mall. The big shopping mall today, but <laughs> yeah, in my day, that was that was sprawling farmland, mm -hmm. with uh, farmhouses dotting the landscape. Um, even close to what what uh, is Centennial Park, there were orchards there, and I remember as a child walking to Centennial Hill, and we would cut through the orchards to get there. And that today is is all gone. It's it's all paved over, unfortunately. Yeah. Now I I live in Etobicoke, but I can't even conceive that landscape because it has so drastically changed. Oh, it, for people today who, who don't know this area, uh, describe it now. Well, now it's just it's wall-to-wall -wall cement. It's it's concrete. It's housing. It's uh, commercial property, uh, parking lots. It doesn't resemble anything that it that it, the beauty of what it once had at you know in the 70s and the 80s. Yeah. Why does disappearing farmland matter to you? It matters to me because. You know, it's like what, what one of my colleagues in the history department told me. I, I teach at Okanagan College, and, and he said to me, Mark, we always have to remember that revolution is always three square meals away. So with, with that advice or, or that caveat, I'm, I'm very concerned about uh, our ability to keep our food security uh, in the next 5, 10, 15, even as far as 30 years out. Mm -hmm. Let, let's talk about specifics here. Uh, first of all, what are the factors that are causing farmland to disappear? Primarily, it's it's development. It's uh, here in Toronto or the, or the GTA. Um, as, as you said, I, I flew in early this morning and I was looking out the plane window, and as far as you could see on the horizon, all there were were lights. So really, urban sprawl is is a great threat to some of the greatest farmland here in southern Ontario. You think about the Holland Marsh. Um, that's that's an area that I used to drive through as a child going up to uh, ski at, in, in the Barrie area. And now, apparently, Barrie has become a, a bedroom community for Toronto. And to me, that's unfathomable. It's, it, it's something that I could never have imagined when I was 15, 16, 17 years old. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that, that here in the province, I mean, we already import billions of dollars in food, more than we export even. So why don't we just import more? You know, why don't we just concentrate our, our economy and our industries in other areas and we'll just import more food? Well, say that to the Europeans and they'll laugh at you. I think the difference in perspective has to do with the fact that we've never really starved as a nation, whereas you go to other countries in, in Central Europe and post-Second World War, they went through a food crisis. So when you say to them, give up food sovereignty, they basically just laugh at you. So if politicians bring in policies that are counterproductive to food production and food security in European countries, uh, the farmers are out on the street, the people are out on the street. It's a very different reaction to what we have here. We've become very complacent over the past 40, 50 years. And if we think about it, we're already importing about 40% of our food. So we're, we're starting to almost hit that halfway point. And if we remember um, the rice crises um, in 2008 and all the rice producing countries shut their borders, it, it's a reminder that we're very vulnerable to, to other countries closing their borders in times of crises. Yeah. And today we're, we're reminded again with, with Russia closing their border to wheat. And uh, wheat prices are currently going up. I think last last week the the the, the statistic was it's gone up 11 percent in price on, on the markets. So we're this is going to translate into higher bread costs and pasta costs. When we go to shop at the at the grocery store, we're going to find higher prices at the shelves. Mm -hmm. Now now that that's hard to swallow. I'm sorry, <laughs> but it is right. It's hard to take literally for many people. But what will it take? Do you think? for this message to really hit home. You know, when we speak in sort of grand terms and we speak in statistics, and it, I, I, for, for many people, it doesn't really hit them hard. What, what would it take? So you're asking me, what's the human story? 
Mm. In, in a sense. The human story would, would really be some kind of crises where people couldn't go to their corner store and be able to access a basic food staple. And if we think about what happened uh, in Ontario and Quebec, what was it, a year and a half, two years ago with the tomatoes that were being uh, brought into the country from Mexico and there was the the scare over salmonella, I think it was, uh, salmonella poisoning. I think that's a reminder to say that we have to maintain at least the minimum standard of control over the, at least the quality of food that's coming into, into Canada. So whether that means changing policies um, is, is a question for the politicians to consider. But we as consumers have a tremendous amount of power. We can go into the stores and talk to, to the managers in our grocery stores and say, look, I would have bought this product if it had come from Ontario or Quebec or, or at least from Canada. And I'm seeing this change back home in Kelowna. Uh, when we moved to Kelowna from Vancouver in 2004, I could not purchase Okanagan fruit at my local grocery store. I walk into a big box store, couldn't purchase it. I could find fruit from New Zealand, from Washington State, um, from other countries like Chile. And now today, six years later, I walk into the same store and they have a whole section on, and the marketing is uh, food that has been grown close by. So it's amazing what we can do as consumers when we start demanding for the products that we think our families deserve and our children deserve. Yeah. Now, what do you think about, about this growing movement, about local food, that, you know, the 100-mile diet, farmers markets? Is that making a real significant impact I think it is because it is almost a serendipity. When I when I flew in this morning, I was sitting beside a woman by the name of Barbara who lives on the Danforth. And we had a funny connection because back in the 70s, she did the back to earth hippie thing where her and her family went to Salt Spring Island and raised their own sheep and chickens and grew their own food. And now she's living in, in, in the Danforth area. But she makes a concerted effort to go to uh, an organic store on the Danforth, apparently called the, the Big Carrot. And apparently that particular enterprise focuses on produce or, or keeping produce in stock that is from the 100-mile the mm -hmm. radius of, of the GTA. But you know what? That's if you have money. You know, oftentimes uh, local organic food costs more. And, and justifiably, it costs more. But then not everybody has that money to spend. So how do we address those issues, right? I mean, if, if we want food to be available, to good, healthy food, right? To be, how do you address those kinds of, you know, populations that are low income, that are the homeless, uh, vulnerable populations, right? And, and to people who just can't afford to spend X amount of money more, right? For Absolutely, and that's the basic question that most people pose. It even has a, a context within environmentalism. How can people care about the environment if their bellies are empty? So it is a valid question. I think there are things that we can do to address that situation. One is looking at economies of scale. So the more organic produce that can be put into the marketplace, the lower cost will, will result in the long run. And I think there, there are uh, enterprises like Walmart who is, is trying that experiment. You know, 10 years ago, who would have thought of organic food being sold at, at a Walmart, whereas today it's a reality. Um, other things that we can do, we can also grow our own food. Um, community gardens are, are popping up around the country incredibly. My wife Life teaches a grade four or five at Glenmore Elementary in, in Kelowna, and it's the first school in the area that put in like a community style garden on the school ground. So the kids are learning about the value of real food because there is a hidden high cost to cheap food. If we think about it, we've been addicted to cheap food since about 1950, 1955, when the Green Revolution really started. And, you know, we had the fertilizers and the pesticides and, and we were bringing kind of like the, the, the Ford mass production model to farming. And again, there's where economies of scale kicks in. It reduced the overall cost of food. So traditionally, we pay about 8% of our gross income to food. Other people in the world, like the Europeans, they pay 25% of their gross income for food. So we have to change that mindset. And part of that is knowing how difficult it is to grow your own food. I challenge people out there to start a, a small vegetable plot where you can grow your own tomatoes or onions or garlic or, or what have you. And you'll see how difficult it is. And when you see the prices on the shelf, you'll know that those prices really um, reflect the, the value, the labor, the effort and the energy that, that went into producing them. Mm -hmm. um, other things that we can do, well, it, it really is the responsibility of the consumer to say, um, I'm not uh, pur um, purchasing at your particular um, retail outlet. I'm going to go maybe purchase...